But over the past few weeks, we've been following this series called A Better Way. Uh, this has been a unique summer for me. This is the only time, the second time that I've spoken the entire summer here at the bridge. And, uh, and so this week, I uh, had to write a message again. And I was like, oh, how do I do that? And, but the, it's been great. I mean, Tim Green spoke last week on prayer. And, uh, and then Kevin spoke the week before that. Alicia spoke on busyness and how do we rest. And uh, there's just been some key things about journeying through our faith and what it means to follow Christ. Because following Christ is a better way. And what does that look like? How do we unpack that? And we're going to be actually continuing this into the fall uh, next Sunday. Uh, we're having our baptism service, and we will not be here. Um, there are uh, chart, or, sorry, maps at the back. Uh, our whole service will be at, uh, up on Graphite Lake at the property of Lloyd and Aaron Robinson. Uh, a number of people are getting baptized. It's going to be just an amazing time. And if you uh, have not been baptized and you would like to be baptized, um, come and talk to me. It is uh, such a powerful example of what you're, of the desire to follow Christ, uh, this public declaration, but also this recognition that as Christ died and rose again, you are dying to things in your own life. And that's actually something we're going to be talking about today is some of the things that, some, some thing that we have to die to in our lives. As we start today, I want everybody to read with me. I'm going to ask that you stand again as we read scripture. This is John 15, verse, starting verse 9 from the New Living Translation, and everybody just read with me. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commands, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Thank you. It's interesting that I'm speaking on this today because up until Friday, uh, I had a completely different thought about, what, about the message I was going to bring today. And it was all prepared, ready to go. And then met with Kevin, and he made me change my mind. Thanks, Kevin. And because uh, there was this other just gnawing, uh, not gnawing, I didn't believe it was God's spirit, just really like, this has been huge this week. I'm going to talk about it, but there's been a few conversations I've had this week about this very thing. You will be filled with my joy. I have read John 15 a lot. I meditate in it a lot. It's one of the key passages, I believe. The whole discourse from John 13 to John 17, that upper room discourse where Jesus starts talking about him leaving this earth. And, you know, John 13, the, you know, the new commandment I give to you, love one another. John 14, he starts talking about the Holy Spirit. John 15, he says, this is what life looks like when you abide in me. John 16, he comes back to the Holy Spirit again, just saying, guys, I got to go. And then John 17, the Lord's Prayer before he died. And this whole narrative is just so, so powerful. And John 15, to abide in him, and that was one of the things that Leisha talked about. And, and when I read this this week, there is, um, I'm doing, many of you were following along doing the Bible recap, and, and this week I started another, doing that, but another plan with a friend. And uh, just focusing on grace and gratitude and this verse, this passage actually was in one of those days. And it really marked me in a way that I don't, I've never read it before, or <laughs> never paid attention to it before. Where Jesus said, you will be filled with my joy. Picture that. Sit with that. Filled with the joy of Jesus. Yes, your joy will overflow. How many want that? 
This is where every hand goes up. (laughs) I want that. I want the joy of Jesus. Because the joy of Jesus is not dependent on circumstances. And I want to talk about this today because as we, I want to focus on joy. Before we do, we need to understand that joy, joy is not happiness. Joy is not happiness. And the, 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 uh, the Greek word for the word joy is charis, which we get the word charismatic from. And it's actually a noun. It's not a verb. It's not an adjective. It's actually a noun. But before we talk about joy, we have to understand what hap- that it is not happiness. Happiness is an emotion based on circumstances and outcomes. Happiness is an emotion based on circumstances and outcomes. And there's nothing wrong with happiness. Uh, hands up if you want to be happy. You know, more hands go up that time. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> but happiness is dependent on circumstances and outcomes. I mean, too, I mean you start the morning... Um, I was carrying my mug around today. Oh, there, yeah, it's right there. <laughs> a lot of people were getting a laugh out of it. And they asked me if I was going to show it, and I said no, but then I'll change my mind. <laughs> this is, I bought this mug for myself uh, when Angie and I made a trip. To, it says, a fun thing to do in the morning is not talk to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have this on, this on my coffee bar at home. I have this other sign that says, uh, coffee pairs well with silence. Um... <laughs> Because you start the morning and, you know, however you start it, that's how I start. Just, uh, I need silence, I need quiet. And I'm happy (laughs) in that. And then your day goes along and you encounter people. And sometimes that brings happiness, sometimes not so much. Your work, etc., right? Like happiness just goes up and down. By 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you might be feeling really good, and then you get another text, another, someone posts something, or your boss or something happens. And happiness crashes. It's all over the place. Again, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not mm, constant. Joy, on the other hand, in the Greek, as I said, it's, a, it's this noun. And when you chase this word out and what it means, it brings this. Joy is gratitude rooted in grace, no matter the circumstances. Joy is ra- gratitude rooted in grace, no matter the circumstances. Joy supersedes circumstances, and when you have it, it's permanent. And when you have it, it permeates your life because it overrides whatever is happening around you and in you. Today, at the end of our time, I'm going to look at four practical ways from the book of Philippians of how we can start structuring our lives so that we can experience joy. Paul wrote statements like, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And these are the kind of things that Paul is writing while while he was in prison. A place where you would think, well, how can you have joy there? A place where most of us would go, that's not fun. That's not a place to have joy. But Paul wrote Philippians, which is in some books, in some Bibles, the heading is the book of joy. Paul wrote that in prison. In a circumstance that we would assume no joy, Paul states that, oh no, I have joy because my joy is rooted in gratitude, grounded in the grace of God, no matter the circumstances. And Paul understood what we need to understand, that he is a child, Paul knew that he was a child of the king. He had been adopted into the family of God. He is joint heir with Jesus Christ. Things, there is nothing, nothing in this world that can change that. There's an unconditional love that, that this, is, this, this is God's grace in his life. And because of these unmovable, unchangeable things, There was always joy in spite of the circumstances. Have you embraced grace on that level? 
when you think about, as I look out and I'm like, most of us here are followers of Christ and, and if you're here today and you're still in that place of searching, still in that place of questioning, still in that place of following, maybe not yet believing, this is what we welcome in. This is who we, what we find is grace. So powerful. And because of that grace, if it lands, there is a joy that is not dependent on circumstances and situations. As I was writing this talk yesterday afternoon, (laughs) I thought, imagine, imagine what would happen if we could develop a culture of joy. I had a lot of great meetings this week. Um, There was a couple of them (laughs) were on the golf course uh, where I actually aggravated a really bad injury and I might have to shut down golf for the rest of this year. Thank you. (laughs) Um, And uh, it it actually happened from piling all my wood because I grabbed the wood and it aggravated here and then Golfing doesn't help that, apparently. (laughs) So I had some great meetings this week. But there was one that marked me. I was meeting with a young person this week. And this person said to me, we are created by the God of the universe. We are created in his image to reveal his glory here on earth. How cool is that? (laughs) And this person, there's a joy in this person. There is a peace in this person that, well, you can see it in their eyes. It's in their countenance. And this person said that a couple times and and then looked at me and said, is that not amazing? And I'm looking at this person going, yeah, it is. To my shame, I don't really think about it enough. And I, the next morning, (coughs) during my just quiet time, as I journaled, I'm like, God, forgive me. Forgive me for not starting each day. Being reminded that the God of, that created this universe knows me, has called me. I am his own, created to reveal his glory. And that's landing in ways, in new ways in me. An attitude like that, that I witnessed that day, is grounded in joy, is grounded in this grace. But here's the thing, you and I have to fight for it. We have to fight for joy. It has to be produced by the work of the Spirit, and you, but you and I have to fight for it. And if you do not have it today, if you do not have this joy, I want to suggest that maybe, just maybe, it's been stolen from you. We need to realize that we live in a battle. It's a spiritual battle that we live in. And in this battle, there is an ancient enemy that wants to steal our joy. Galatians 5, I want to read this with you. So I say, Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing whatever your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. So as you read this, think of this battle. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. There is a battle so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. 
But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery. Pay attention to this part of it. Because most of us are like, ah, that's not me, that's not me. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this this kind of fruit in our lives. So let's, the battle. We've got the battle of our old nature, the battle of the flesh. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Say this with me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to to his cross and crucified them there. In other words, if joy is going to live in your life, something else has to die. If joy is good, that was one of the fruits of the Spirit, if it's going to live in your life, something else is going to have to die. And that something that has to die is our sinful nature, the flesh, the me, the I want, the I decide for my life. That part has to go away. Paul goes on in verse 25, and he says, since we are living by the Spirit, now that's an assumption. Is it true? Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. At the end of the day, We have to fight for joy. And the only way we can fight and win is if we're rooted in Jesus, if we are abiding in Jesus, if we are choosing to be led by his spirit. The reverse is true. If we are losing this conflict, if there is no joy, then you are not rooted in in abiding in Jesus. You are not rooted in following the spirit. You are rooted in self. Do you see the conflict? Because the battle is real. And you're moving in one direction or the other. There's no neutral ground. And so what is the fruit that you're seeing in your life? Because the fruit of a life abiding, the fruit of a life being led by the Spirit, produces love, joy, And the list goes on. The life rooted in self produces death in and around you. The life rooted in Christ and his spirit produces life in and around you. And self produces death in and around you. I mean, in case you've forgotten, (laughs) there it is again. This is the fruit of of what happens when we're rooted in Christ. And this is the fruit of what happens when we're rooted in self. I heard this statement once, and it made me pause. The main fruit that self produces in relation to joy is the fruit of an ungrateful spirit. Can't remember where I heard it. I've written it down in my journal. It came to mind when I was writing this. And I remember when I wrote that down, I had to pause, and I'm like, do I believe that statement? The main fruit that self produces in relation to joy is the fruit of an ungrateful spirit. If this is the definition of joy, gratitude rooted in grace no matter the circumstances, then that makes this statement true. 
Joy is gratitude rooted in grace and circumstances. Therefore, the enemy of joy is an ungrateful spirit rooted in self. And I think it expresses itself in two major ways. First of all, when we have the circle of self, it expresses itself and we see it when it shows up with the sense of entitlement. And when it, when, when it hears, when entitlement hears about the grace of God, it says, I deserve it. I'm good. I deserve the grace of God. I deserve everything in my life that's good. I deserve everything that to be good. And when this is your attitude, you are actually fostering an ungrateful spirit. Because everything that comes along, you believe you deserve it. And when you did not get what you thought you should get, then you envy, compare, and complain until you get what you want because you're in control. This spirit of entitlement snuffs out gratitude and always, always steals joy. And for all of us sitting here today, we have so much in our lives. And it's a big, big deal because we can look around in this North American culture that we live and go, yes, I deserve all of this. <sighs> I find myself guilty of this. I'm entitled. Of course my life is good for mostly because I deserve it. <laughs> I'm a good person. I'm a pastor for crying out loud. <laughs> As some of you know, I took two weeks and... Um, every summer and spend it at my friend's cottage. And this year, as I was at the cottage, some of you know that Manly and I uh, just, we spent almost two weeks in Uganda. And there's uh, one of the guys that we got to know better, Joel. Incredible man. He's, he oversees with I Live Again Uganda. He oversees the trauma counseling, going into all the tribes and villages and walking the trauma counseling through. He has a life that's so busy. His wife is a nurse, works six days a week, 12-hour shifts every day. They have a young family. They struggle to find rest. They struggle to just be together. And they're seeing parts of their family crack and erode because of the busyness that their life demands. I had a lot of good conversations with Joel about trying to find rest. And as I was sitting on the dock one morning, thinking, yeah, I deserve this. <laughs> I deserve this quiet, this peace. A message comes in from Joel. Hey, hope you're doing well. I'm in, he's in the Choli Quarter, which is the slum in Kampala where the people had fled during the war. He said, I've been here since that was on Saturday, he messaged me. He said, I've been here since Wednesday, going back tonight. He said, I hope you're doing well. And in this moment, I felt guilt for my rest. <laughs> I felt guilt for the fact that the very thing he needs to do, I can do so easily, and he can't. And then there was this moment where I wrestled with that, and I'm like, why is this so, so, why am I fighting, why am I wrestling with this? And in that moment, I just felt God say, because you don't see the grace in this gift you have. You think you deserve it. <laughs> you think that the world owes you this. And it was humbling. We have entitlement 
is showing up in our lives and we go, yeah, I deserve this, I deserve, I work hard, I deserve this, I put in the long shifts, I deserve this, yeah, I bought that, I deserve that, I deserve it, I deserve it. If that's the message of our heart, it will steal joy because it's all about me. Remember the parable, not the parable, the story of the 10 lepers that came to Jesus? And they all got healed. Now picture this, I mean, because we forget what leprosy looks like. I remember taking a trip to the Dominican and visiting a leper colony where I walked around and saw people with fingers missing, limbs missing, toes missing, feet missing. Jesus was with 10 of them, and oh, by the way, the fact that he was with them meant he was unclean and would not be allowed to come in. Let's not forget that, that Jesus extended himself in spite of the cost 10 of them were healed. Like, can you imagine this? <laughs> Toes are back. I can walk now. My hand is back. There's not a nub here anymore. Grows back. 10 of them, completely healed of leprosy. Only one said thank you that caught Jesus' attention, and he was a Samaritan, <laughs> the lowest of the lows. And that person had a heart of gratitude that recognized that grace had just touched his life. Entitlement, I deserve, robs, steals joy. Now this gets a bit tricky. Self also works itself out in shame. It also works itself out in shame. And shame, when it hears about the grace of God, says, I could never receive it. I could never receive it. Shame says, it may work for others, but I'm not going to be able to receive that goodness and grace and forgiveness. I'm not going to be able to receive the holiness and the righteousness of Christ. I I'm not going to be able to receive the new life, that new identity, that sonship, that daughtership, that seat at the table, that place with God. I am not going to be able to fully receive that. And this is actually the same as entitlement. Because you are saying my opinion about what I should get trumps God's opinion of what he wants to give me. It's still about you. Shameful people think that it is humility working itself out when the root is actually self. And the root of self is pride. I, we have to catch this. That the root of self, entitlement, shame, self, the root of it is pride because it's all about you. And friends, as we sit here today and think about joy, think about what steals our joy, the only thing, the only remedy for both is a revelation of God's grace and glory. A revelation of God's glory and grace. And to understand this, and please understand this. I don't deserve anything. We don't. Actually, what I do deserve is death. Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death. I don't know about you. I know I've sinned. The wages of sin is death. But, but, because of grace, not because of anything I've done, not because I deserve it, not because I don't think I deserve it, but because of grace, I have life in Christ Jesus. And when I see that, truly see that, that is a revelation of his grace and his glory. I don't deserve anything but death, but by grace, I get a new life in Christ. In other words, 
the ultimate fruit, the ultimate fruit that was given to us, came to us, was Jesus. And just as Isaiah the prophet prophesied, Jesus was a tender shoot that would be cut off. And he was going to be offered for you and for me so that that entitled person could see the gap and go, wow, the one who Paul said had the title above every title came for me. So that the person who has shame it could, it can say, I could never receive it, but I'm humbled. I'm aware of the fact that he came for me and that he was crushed for me. Jesus was crushed for you. Both the entitled and the ones who live by shame. And when we realize what Jesus did for us, that there is a new wine, there is a new covenant made possible through the death of Christ. When we realize that, entitlement goes out the window. And people who live under shame all their lives realize what, when they realize what is in the cup, that what was in there was what made them feel ashamed. So many people have heard the victory story, but they've never come to lift the cup. They've never come to lift it for themselves. So there's still no joy. We come into this place so often and we've sung the songs of victory, 
But for a lot of you, you still don't know that when Christ took the cup, it was your cup. And in the garden, when he said, your will, not mine, it was my sin. It was your sin. And when he hung on the cross, it was for my shame. It was for your shame. And when he said it was finished, it really was finished. So that you could, maybe for the first time in your life, hold up the cup and say, this is mine. This is my grace. This is my forgiveness. This is my kindness. This is my love. This is my brand new life. This is a brand new life that I'm lifting up, and it's the cup of Jesus. And shame is done, and entitlement is done. And when the revelation of grace and glory lands, it does the same thing for everyone. It produces grateful people. And now, instead of self and center, and now instead of it's all about me, the center is the revelation of his grace and glory moving in every direction, seeing grateful people going everywhere. And grateful people have joy. David Harrison is going to pray for our emblems. And as we share it, as we take this, my question is, is this your story? That what you're holding is a revelation of God's grace and his glory for you. Let us pray. Lord God, um, we have been so challenged this morning by what Steve has shared. And to be um, truly humbled, Lord, by when we consider how you suffered for us, Lord, that we might have life and to spend eternity with you, Lord. You said in that room that night that there is no greater gift than to lay down one's life for your friends. And so, Lord, encourage us that we may lay down our lives for our friends, Lord, to remember that we were the most important thing in your life and that we should give our friends that same priority. So, Lord, we take the, the wine and the bread, um, just acknowledging your suffering and your blood, that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we just humbly give you thanks. Thank you, Jesus. On my desk at home, I have several communion cups from times I've taken communion that marked me deeply, that sit there to remind me of that moment. With this journey that I went on through this week with recognizing the grace that is represented in this, and it was for me. It wasn't what I deserved, but it's what I received. And I don't want to lose this thought. 
I don't want my life to start tomorrow without recognizing God's glory and grace in my life because that is the foundation to walk in love, in joy, in peace. And so I'm going to be adding another communion cup to my desk as a reminder. I said at the beginning that we would close today with just some practical steps of how we can see joy being built into our lives. And they're from the book of Philippians. I'm going to give the statement and the verse and um, maybe when the, at the end when all four are up, you might want to grab a screenshot or uh, wait for the video to come out. But what I want you to do is look at the statement and the verse and take some time on your own and look into this. Practically, how do we grow joy? First of all, identify the things you are grateful for and give thanks. Identify the things that you are grateful for and give thanks. Philippians 1.3, Paul says to these people from prison, every time I think of you, there's gratitude. There's a heart of thankfulness. There is a connection between gratitude and joy. Maybe for some of you, it's going to be a, a gratitude journal where you're going to start every day just saying, I'm thankful for something, someone, and then you're going to remember that every day. I would encourage you to do that throughout the day because what happens as we go through the day, <laughs> bang, bang, circumstance, and we shift to, oh, I'm entitled, I'm not getting what I deserve, or, oh, I don't, you know, oh, it's such a battle. So identify the things you're grateful for and give thanks. Love, uh, don't ask of people, so don't over ask of people and things. Don't over ask of people and things. Enjoy what you have. Enjoy the people around you. Enjoy the things you have. But never let the people or the things around you be your source of joy. Source of joy comes from Christ and needs to be in Christ. We need to love as Jesus commanded. Love as Jesus loved. We read this at the beginning. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commands, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you might be filled with my joy. Yes, you will overflow. So you hear, follow my commands, and you'll have my joy, and my joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other the same way I have loved you. If you want joy in your life, practice gratitude. Make sure your joy stays centered in Christ. It's not centered in people or things. And love. Jesus said, if you love as I have, my joy will be there. And finally, keep seeking Jesus. Keep seeking Jesus. You have to make abiding in Christ your number one priority. You have to prioritize the relationship to the vine, John 15. And the main way we stay connected in gratitude is, stay, is to stay connected to the vine. The main way we walk in gratitude and therefore have constant joy in this life is to prioritize our relationship with Christ. Stay connected to the author of grace because there's a connection between grace and generosity. It was the generosity of the king who would be crushed for the entitled and the shamed so that we could be brought from death to life and invited into a relationship Jesus, with Jesus. And he says, you can come to me. 
Friends, joy is not out there. Joy is found in one place, and it's in Christ. And joy is a person, and his name is Jesus. The more Jesus, the more joy. Jesus says, if you put me at the center, you will be filled with joy. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to pray as we're dismissed. Father, in only a way that you can, through your spirit, I ask for myself and for each person here that your grace would land. Whether our bent is to think I deserve everything I have or our bent is to say I don't deserve anything, God, that bent either way is built in pride and all about self. Holy Spirit, help us to die to self and help us receive deeply in our souls, in our spirit, a revelation of your grace and your glory. Help us, I pray, to have hearts of gratitude. Help us, I pray, to be in the place where our focus, our attention, our joy is only centered in Christ, not in things and people. Help us to love as Jesus loved. And help us through your spirit to stay connected to the vine so that joy marks us in spite of the circumstances because we're rooted in, alive in the grace of God. I ask this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. As I mentioned, next week is the baptism. There are maps at the back. If you want to, if you want to geek it out and do your own thing, you can grab a screenshot there, put in the coordinates, or hit that link. Salads and desserts are to be brought, right, Christina? Okay, bring a salad, dessert, and a chair. Repeat that after me. I'm bringing a salad or dessert and chair. Or you can bring salad and dessert <laughs> and a chair. No, you've got to bring a chair. And if you want coffee next week, bring it. It, we, it won't be there. Okay, so bring your own coffee, your own tea, your own chair, salad, dessert, and the barbecue will be provided. Same time, 10 o'clock next Sunday at that location. God bless you. We'll see you next week.